You may remember during 2007, the troop surge in Iraq. Thousands more U.S. troops were deployed in the hope of bringing stability to the chaos that had erupted after the invasion. One of my pals went to Al Anbar province with the 2nd Infantry Division as a chaplain. The Army has always collected an assortment of colorful characters, idealists and adventurers, those joining to find themselves and those joining to hide themselves, ruffians and poets. And they were all there in El Anbar province, many perhaps not so receptive to the gospel peddled by the army issue Charlie Chaplin in shortages and hot spots, boredom and fatigue, my pal noticed something as he worked with the soldiers of the 2nd Infantry Division. Even the heathen know how to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It's something more than a sentimental song in a severe climate far away from home. It's hard sometimes for church folk to stomach when we have burdened ourselves for so long with a merit system and want to see some reward for our labors. It's hard to stomach when we discover that those guilty of wrongs, the wrongs we have so long opposed, for example, racism and sexism and colonialism and the like, that these two are sisters and brothers to whom the divine generosity has been shown. Grace no longer seems so sentimental. Well, what do you say? Let's walk through these doors and let's worship God. A blessed good morning to you one and all and welcome to Drexel Hill United Methodist Church this 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Let us begin our worship now by joining together in the call to worship included in your bulletin. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshippers will worship God in spirit and truth. For such worshippers God seeks. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving, God's courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord. Bless God's name. Let us join now together in praying the collect for the morning. Give us, Senor, a little sun, a little happiness, and some work. Give us a heart to comfort those in pain. 
Give us the ability to be good, strong, wise, and free, so that we may be as generous with others as we are with ourselves. Finally, Senor, let us all live as your own one family. Amen. As we move now to our service of confession, I say to you, we know ourselves to be a broken people, separated from ourselves, others, and the Lord of life. Let us then confess our brokenness together. O oh God, source of all that makes life possible, giver of all that makes life good, we gather to give you our thanks. Yet we confess that we have often failed to live our thankfulness. What we have, we take for granted, and we grumble about what we lack. We have squandered your bounty with little thought of those who will come after us. We are more troubled by the few who have more than by the many who have less. Forgive us, O oh God, in this hour of worship, Accept our thanksgiving and teach us to make gratitude and sharing our way of life through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us receive our pardon in one voice, saying, Thanks be to God. And now, dear sisters and brothers, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Let us join now together in praying the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again at noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired, about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. 
And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Is there a more cherished word in the Christian vocabulary than grace? It describes the mercy of God ever demonstrated to undeserving people. Amazing Grace is by far the favorite hymn in American churches. Popularity, though, makes grace lose its cutting edge. Familiarity <laughs> breeds contempt. Grace is offensive. Grace is rude to our sensitivities. Oh, it's getting acculturated, divorced from the character of the righteousness of God, resulting in a, a saccharine permissiveness. And that comes in a few flavors. It's not always apparent to the sinners or the self-righteous. No image jostles or jars the sentimentality quite like our reading of this morning's parable of the labors in the vineyard. In a vivid and even abrasive story, the radical and offensive nature of grace is depicted, inevitably leaving the hearer with the question, was the owner really fair? Don't the laborers who worked all day have a legitimate beef? I guess, I need to give you a word of warning. This is a parable that needs very little explanation or interpretation from pulpiteers. So I, I can't tell you a bunch about this parable. I, it would be wrong for me to tell you a lot about the parable. The power of this parable is all about how we hear and understand it and respond to it. So the work of this parable really takes place not from the pulpit, <laughs> but inside our own spirits, inside our own sense of justice and grace. Its impact is so forceful, so direct, so engaging that I better just get out of the way and let the parable confront you. And with each of us, and with the congregation, figure out what it means. What did you hear? What did you understand? Better yet, do you understand why you're reacting the way you are? I remember when I was in high school, this was just the most irritating possible parable. Because what I wanted to do was translate the economy of God into the economy of the world. And they simply don't go together. They're always in tension. They are always at odds. And this is the lot of the person of Christian faith, to understand 
how to live in the world, but always to be looking to something heavenly. It's a lifelong, multi-generational, multi-millennial project to offer the grace of God, to offer the grace of God. This parable has two sets of relationships that are really great. The workers go out and work all day, and then they get paid, and they see what happens. And the laborers who labored but an hour get the same wage as the ones who took the heat of the day. So the first group's anticipation of a bigger wage mounts as they see the generosity shown to others, and when they receive only what they had agreed to, understandably, they grumble against the landowner. And we need to linger a bit over the apparent unfairness of the owner. I mean, the image of what happened if the world really functioned that way. You, you couldn't do this two days in a row. I mean, people would figure out what it was. In the economy of the world, this is a failed system. It doesn't work. But we're talking about God's grace. We're not talking about picking turnips. What if the equal pay for equal work principle were not operative. Why, people would sleep late and come to the labor pool only on the late afternoon shift if they knew what they would get paid for the whole day. The owner's reaction upsets the whole arrangement of the whole societal order by no means an evil arrangement since it institutionalizes an important principle of justice. Well, that's the way it works on the cabbage truck. Divine grace, of course, does not rest on the merit system, but because it doesn't, we insiders are prone to grumble. We wonder if grace does not undermine the whole reason for being good, for observing standards, for keeping rules, for living justly. We second guess a God who breaches the system and equalizes the pay like this. We could support the owner's generosity if the groups of workers that came after noon had merely been delayed, if the truck that had brought them had failed to bring them to the fields on time, if it had broken down. But the owner's actions are not the sign of a little generosity to an unfortunate few. They call for a totally different way of viewing God. But the second set of relationships in the parable gets even deeper into the offensive character of grace. The relationship between the laborers who work all day and the laborers who came late. The early ones are envious of the generosity shown the others. Presumably, had they been the recipients of the owner's gracious method of bookkeeping, they would have been overjoyed. What they cannot take is the beneficence that puts these latecomers on a par with them. The grumblers are not really against grace. They are against grace shown to others and what that implies. It's an old story that we've seen in the Bible many, many times. Jonah sat on the hill under a tree and pouted because the city was spared. The elder brother thought the father a doting old fool when his father invited him to join the celebration when the prodigal son returned. The Pharisees at prayer thank God that he is not like the sinful publican. And that's the point. 
Divine grace is a great equalizer which rips away presumed privilege and puts all recipients on a par. In grace, we are no better and no worse than one another. We are sisters and brothers in God's loving eyes. Amen. Amen. As we move now to our sending forth, I say to you, to live is to risk and to care. We are ready to live for all humankind. Life is mission. We choose to be sent. And now as you have been gathered in from the world to hear the gospel proclaimed, I send you back now into that same world to offer the love of Christ. And take this benediction with you. God the creator, God the redeemer, God the sustainer be with you now and remain with you evermore. Amen.